Most bankers aren't ready to help you until after their third cup of coffee. But with Central National Bank's after-hours service, you don't have to wait for the bank lobby to open to get help. You can contact us from 6 to 8.30 in the morning or from 5 to 10 in the evening, and we'll connect you to a real, live, local person who can answer questions and fix problems seven days a week. Bank different. Bank central. Central National Bank. Member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women's Hoops and Talks, the What Podcast, where we are elevating the voice of women in basketball. I am Tara Bowen Biggs, and I am joined today by Cassidy Gemmett. Cassidy, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Very good. Did you have a happy holiday? I did. Crazy busy. Lots of cooking. So it was fun. Not just a uh, happy Thanksgiving, but we also should uh, pause and say happy birthday to one Mr. Terry Stotts. Happy birthday, Coach. Uh, It sounds like you got a lot of good birthday messages. And I, I learned that Terry Stotts never seems to forget other people's birthdays on his birthday. I know that was so thoughtful. He had the little um Casey Holdall the yeah. Blazer beat reporter had all the messages that Terry Stotts had sent him through the years and it was so cute. I love it. That's it's so wonderful. I loved that it, there were like emojis and I just I mean, <laughs> the idea of Terry Stott sitting there trying to figure out which would be the perfect emoji to convey his feelings was just too great. Yeah. And then also imagining the wonderful Terry Stott's faces while trying to convey those emojis because I love all the faces that he makes. Yeah. He has an so amazing, expressive. Uh, amazingly expressive face. He could be just like a face actor where all he does is make expressions. And uh, he had that. He had quite a snazzy bow tie on for his birthday. It looked like it had sprinkles on it. I thought, nice. (laughs) But the Blazers did not deliver the win that uh, he was hoping for. I think. Yeah, that was a little bit. That was definitely disappointing. But still, a solid game, I guess. Good points. I am one hundred percent convinced that the Blazers lost it because Nurkic was out, and they just did not know how to recover. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Plus, can... the Clippers are a good team. Yeah, and they have been surprising a lot of people. And I think they are they seem to be a team that Doc Rivers enjoys coaching, which I think makes for fun basketball to watch. And I think they're kind of a surprise this season. Yeah, I I think they are too. And it seems like they are pretty happy in that sort of under the radar. We're just a bunch of guys who play hard and we're going to show up and play every night. Um, but definitely not where people thought they would be. I mean, they were, I mean, did you think how different they are right now than from what they were, you know, 18 months ago, a year ago? <laughs> I mean, I, they're a completely different team. Yeah. They're all like Chris Paul, Blake Griffin and uh, DeAndre Jordan are all gone. Just like in the blink of an eye, they just turned it over. And no more Austin Rivers, so that changes things, too. Yes, he's busy being the voice of reason in Washington. <laughs> Which, I guess they need one, so good job, Austin. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's a good segue, because today, since uh, we're about 20 games into the season, about a quarter of the way into the season, we thought it would be a good time to go catch up with some of our friends that we talked to in the off season about how their teams are doing and our first person that we're talking to is Sabrina Merchant and she covers both the Clippers and the Lakers for SB Nation so we're going to bring her in in a minute and find out you know the the point of view from folks down in Los Angeles like are they surprised about the Clippers do they even think about the Clippers when they have LeBron (laughs) right there it's going to be interesting to find out so I guess let's just go ahead and uh, share our conversation with Sabrina. And then we'll also talk to Janelle more later on in the show. And we'll check in with her about the Golden State Warriors. I can't wait to find out what she has to say about what's going on down there. I'm very excited to hear the inside scoop.
Okay, we have an awesome guest joining us again, a return to the What Podcast. Sabrina Merchant writes about the Lakers for Silver Screen and Roll, and she also covers the Clippers for Clips Nation, which is part of SB Nation. Sabrina, welcome to the What Podcast. Welcome back. Thanks so much for having me back. Well, it's you have had a uh, busy summer between welcoming LeBron James to the Lakers and also a little surging Clippers. So uh, can't wait to find out how the season's been going. Cassidy, do you want to take it away? Yeah, I'm wondering. I, I, I think a few of us are surprised by the Clippers this season, and I'm wondering what were your expectations going into the season and how are you feeling now about everything? I would agree with you. I think uh, the Clippers have been surprising even for people in L.A. Uh, Personally, I thought they'd be right around that mix competing for the edge of the playoffs and potentially missing out Mm -hmm. just depending on how they took stock of their team at the trade deadline. And especially considering their first 14 games or so were especially brutal schedule-wise, did not expect such an impressive start. But this team, they just... They're just really gritty. They just keep fighting. You know, they have 13 good players they can play any night, and it's that depth really helps them out. Yeah. Do you, are you, have you been extra impressed with any specific players this season? So I'm really happy to see Danilo Gallinari back healthy. Uh, he was one of my favorite players to watch back when he was in Denver. He's just super skilled at that size. And I mean, like, not the unicorn style that we call Vigs these days, but he just is a really fun player to watch. And now that he is removed from almost three seasons of being injured, he's been a delight to watch. And he had that streak where he had uh, 54, 55 made free throws in a row. And as someone who watches a lot of the Lakers, I can tell you that's quite impressive. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I've also really enjoyed watching uh, their rookie, Shea Gildas Alexander. Mm -hmm. who has been just a lot more composed than I would expect any rookie point guard to be, particularly starting for a team that's in first place in the Western Conference. And you got to love Montrezl Harrell, who's just a giant ball of energy and so enjoyable to watch. Yeah, we're still we're still recovering from Montrez Harrell from a couple nights ago. (laughs) That was a, a really impressive win. You don't just go into Portland and win a close game like that. Yeah, he kind of reminds me of Dennis Rodman in some ways under the basket. We're not the first person to make that comparison. Um, uh, There was some national writer, I want to say maybe uh, Stephen A., who called him uh, the closest thing we have to Dennis Rodman in the league right now. Oh, nice. Yeah. Who are some of the uh, fan favorites? You you mentioned some of the guys who are making a big difference on the court. Are there any, you know, stories that maybe haven't come out beyond the local coverage about some of the players on the team well I will say that the fans also really love Montrezl Harrell because it's it's hard not to love a guy who you can just see how hard he's working at any given time on the court and I think people really buy into that when they can feel the passion coming from the guys uh Clipper fans also really like Boban Marjanovic uh I will say that it never really gets quite as loud in Staples Center as when they're announcing his entrance into the game which is just remarkable uh, he's kind of a goofy guy too, like seven foot three, but super lovable. Uh, people really like him in LA. He's got like a side career going on. He's going to be in the next John Wick movie. So he's really taken to the LA. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like he's fitting in perfectly, especially with the Clippers. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, excellent. Yeah. Um, so as a, as a Blazer fan, I've always grown up, kind of rivalry with both the Lakers and the Clippers and especially with the latest kind of playoff season that we had and the few scuffles that we've had do you feel like the fans in LA feel that rivalry at all you know uh the Clippers actually just played the Grizzlies the other day and that was the first time this season that I've really gotten a sense of oh this is a team that we don't like um and I think that's you know still that residue from those 2012-2013 playoff series but I think the Clippers kind of just have this, like, nobody in the league really believes in us kind of vibe going on. Um, every time there is a storyline involving the Clippers, it's like, oh, well, the Bucks are in town or the Warriors are in town, you know. Mm-hmm. And the whole Draymond Green, Katie spat happened after a Clipper game, right? So they're sort of the adjacent party to all these storylines. And they're 
they're kind of perfectly happy with that. You know, they think of themselves as a really good team that hasn't even performed as well as they should have so far. So it, it almost sounds like they feel like a small market team in a big market next to the Lakers. Absolutely. I mean, like Doc Rivers has said that obviously, you know, the Lakers will get more attention because LeBron James is there and they're, you know, they're just happy going about their business, winning more games and <laughs> getting the job done. For the Clippers, one of the things that happened, I can't remember if it happened this last year or the year before, but uh, Doc Rivers used to be both the coach and the GM, and yeah. now he's just coaching. He seems a little bit more relaxed on the sidelines. I would never say he looks actually relaxed, but he seems <laughs> he seems like he has a- adopted, you know, his change to just being going back to being a coach seems like he's adapted to that just fine and there's a lot of talk around the league about how you can't be a general manager and a coach it just doesn't work um what are the thoughts from from fans around there about that so absolutely i think that the sentiment around la too is that it wasn't good for the same person to be occupying the coach and the you know general manager role which is why before the start of last season they uh you know, removed stock from that title and brought in Lawrence Frank to become the general manager. Um, and I think Doc would agree that this is the healthiest the franchise has been in some time. Like back when Blake and DeAndre and Chris Paul were all on the Clippers, they were constantly searching for these other pieces to fill in around them. Like they only had four players they could really trust if you count those three and JJ Redick. And now it's almost like Doc has just this embarrassment of riches to work with. He's constantly just plugging in players left and right. And there's different lineups that make things happen any given game. Like the other day against the Blazers, you know, you had uh, mostly like Tobias and Gallinari and Montrose Harrell because the Williams wasn't getting the job done. But then like on the road trip, you saw Boban get a nice little stint and Niels Teodosic was playing. So I think the fans are really happy with the way this roster has been built. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Doc Rivers wasn't the one in charge of building it. But with the players that he has, I would say that everyone's pretty happy with the way the season has gone and the way he's utilized his rotation. What do you think is the uh, biggest weakness of the team right now, like basketball wise? What are they? What do they struggle with the most? So I think it's two things. Um, one would just be that when they face a really good defense, there isn't that one go-to score that you can turn to. I mean, Lou Williams obviously is one of the highest scorers in the league in the fourth quarter, but he's mostly a jump shooter, so it's hard to rely on that kind of offense all the time. You saw this when the Clippers played Memphis the other day, that they had a lot of difficulty scoring at the end of the game, and the only reason they really got back into it because Memphis also couldn't score once Mike Conley fouled out. Uh, So I think that's one weakness. And then the second thing would be, even though Montrezl Harrell is fantastic as a backup center, he is a backup center and I don't think the Clippers have anyone on their roster that projects as like a strong defensive center for the future. Um, There's, they start marching Gortat, but he like starts for the first and third quarters and then never comes back into the game. And so Montrez is playing these like 16 minute consecutive stretches, which doesn't feel very feasible. Mm -hmm. So rim protection, a defensive center feels like the major thing that Clippers could improve on. Talking about the game the other night, was there a favorite matchup that you liked watching in that game? Anytime I, like, I think, uh, you know, you want to see how one team's backcourt will stack up against Damon CJ. And I was I was pretty pleased watching uh, Avery Bradley and Shea and Pat Beverly do their level best to, you know, force them in tough shots. And down the stretch, even when, like, Gallinari got switched onto those two guys, I thought um, watching that defensive matchup of, Damon TJ going up against the Clipper Bigs was very interesting. Nice. Yeah, it was definitely fun fun to watch. Disappointing on our end, but still fun to watch. One and one so far this season, right? Yeah. You got lucky because there was no Nurkic. I'm just going to say that. Oh, I, I agree. <laughs> I mean, like I told you, that major weakness of the Clippers is, you know, that interior and without Nurkic, that's kind of hard to exploit. I got one last question about the Clippers. Uh, Cassidy and I were just talking about this before we uh, got on with you. Your team looks so different than it did 18 months ago. Like, no Chris Paul, no Blake Griffin, no um, 
DeAndre Jordan. How are those guys received when they come back? And I don't even know, has DeAndre Jordan been back yet? So um, DeAndre Jordan has not been back. Uh, Dallas doesn't come until December. Um, the first time Chris Paul was supposed to come back this year, he was suspended because of that fight with the Lakers. <laughs> That's right. Um, and uh, uh, I, the Detroit, Detroit hasn't come yet this year either. But uh, I would say that uh, because the team is so different, it's not even like a lot of these guys were even teammates with those people, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. only um, the guys who were here for the second half of the season that were brought in for Blake Griffin even played with DeAndre last year. And I think everybody knew that Jordan was out, you know, the minute offseason started. So, uh, when Austin Rivers came back to play with Washington, you know, the guys in the locker room seemed pretty happy to see him. But that was also after a 30-point win against the Wizards. So, hard to everybody's say. Everybody's happy to see the yeah, Wizards. everybody's happy to see them <laughs> after that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's just a new group of guys, really. Like you said, uh, it's, it's almost unrecognizable from when the season started in 2016, 17. And they're sort of just forging their own new identity separate from, you know, Lob City. That's dead. (laughs) Nobody's left from that. And even, uh, Doc Rivers seems like he's a little more rejuvenated with this new group and this new challenge that he has in front of him. Yeah. Well, Let's transition to the Lakers with one question that I had just popped into my head right now. What's the difference between Clippers fans and Laker fans? Okay. So within LA, I would say like 85, 90% of basketball fans are Laker fans and they expect excellence. You know, this recent five year stretch aside, the Lakers have consistently been a playoff team you know, they were in half of the NBA finals that were contested and won half of those. Uh, there's a certain amount of uh, arrogance that comes with Laker fans. They expect to get the best players and they expect to perform at a high level. And there's consequently a lot of pressure on the team because of that. Um, Clipper fans, even with this relative sustained period of success that they've had, particularly while the Lakers were not doing so well, there's always a anxiety a little bit like what could possibly go wrong um which is kind of what makes this new iteration of the Clippers more fun is that this isn't supposed to be the final product you know they're preparing for 2019 free agency much like a lot of the other teams around the league are so the Clippers kind of just are enjoying the moment right now whereas Laker fans are always you know on their toes ready for the postseason you know (laughs) so how have the Lakers been doing this season with the addition of LeBron James and the LA craziness is back in full swing, it seems like? Yeah, it's it's definitely back in full swing. Um, the last time that there's this much drama around the Lakers was definitely when they brought in Dwight Howard and Steve Nash in the 2012 season and <laughs> fired their head coach five games into the season, which seemingly felt like a possibility again this year. Uh, you can definitely say that the craziness is back uh just in terms of like how many people are at laker games again and the decibel level and the crowds there uh even though like it was made clear during the off season like you know the lakers expect to work towards being contenders like they didn't think that this team was a finished product by any means Mm -hmm. it's kind of hard after five years of not making the playoffs to think oh here's lebron james we should be making the finals uh, so there's definitely still that element among the Laker fans of we need to get better faster when, you know, four of the team's best players are in their second or third seasons. So it seems unlikely that it'll happen that quickly, but there's definitely some level of impatience among the fan base. Um, have there been any fun local stories surrounding LeBron that maybe haven't made it out of L.A.? Um. You know, I think LeBron is uh, pretty good at maintaining a uh, even keeled persona. You know, there was a uh, even when all of the drama with Luke is going on, uh, and he uh, he just you know professed confidence in the coach and the front office and said, you know, we're just working through things. And then there was that later report that he almost lost it, but we never really got a sense of that. Uh, you know, he's just been like a a good guy to have on the team. It's, it's kind of funny because 
his his kids are almost closer in age to a lot of his teammates now than he is. Like when you think about Kuzma and Lonzo and Josh Hart and Ingram, like they're all 21, 22, 23. And that's really closer in age to Bronny than it is to LeBron James. So the, the references have kind of gotten lost in translation. You know, that (laughs) um, the way they like talk about their style and the types of video games they play, like that's all more in his son's wheelhouse than it is in LeBron's wheelhouse. But he says, I mean, he just, he's such a great teammate, which it's kind of nice to have around. Like he says such nice things about the young guys in public and takes, you know, such a strong leadership role and accepts responsibility when things go wrong. And it's, it's kind of remarkable. Like you hear all of these good things about him when, you know, he was in Cleveland and when he was in Miami and just to have him in LA, it's even better than advertised. Yeah. It almost seems like an, uh, a new version of LeBron where he's even more accepting of helping the younger players than he was. And he always has been. And it's been interesting to watch that from, an outside perspective this year as well. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we obviously all know that he's one of the best closers in the NBA, but he's been willing to take a bit of a step to the side as Luke Walton has tried to let the other young players navigate situations in close games, which, you know, didn't work out as well as it could have at the beginning of the season, but he's been allowing them to get those reps, you know, as they build towards being a more complete team as the season goes on. What kind of basketball do you think is going to characterize this team? Like, have they found like a basketball identity yet? Are they still kind of feeling their way to figure out what kind of, how they're going to play? That's a really interesting question because when I, you know, took a look at the roster before the season started and you think about how LeBron's teams played in Cleveland the last four years, it seemed pretty clear that this was going to be an offensive team. You know, the way they played against Portland in that first game of the season where they were just running at every dead ball and just blazing up and down the court. That's how I assumed the team was going to look, but they really couldn't play defense during that stretch of the season. And once they added Tyson Chandler and the the defense sort of settled down, they haven't been that high flying transition offense that I anticipated, but they've become a more productive team, so to speak, because they're actually, you know, winning some games now. Uh, it still is weird um, to see LeBron on the court without, like, four shooters surrounding him at all times. Mm-hmm. And as much as I like all of the pieces that the Lakers, you know, had drafted in the last few years, it's hard to say that they're all the most natural fits around LeBron James. So that's still a work in progress. Yeah. I mean, I, as much as I like that the Lakers are winning games now, I definitely prefer the excitement of that offensive style they were playing within the first two weeks of the season. So I think it's still a balancing act that Luke Walton's trying to figure out of how to best achieve success while also still playing the way he wants to play. Because, you know, he came from Golden State and, I'm sure he would love to have more free-flowing offense than what they're currently playing right now. How's the mud lineup uh, going? (laughs) Uh, The mud lineup, wow. Well, I can't remember what that's supposed to say. Misunderstood. uh, Underappreciated. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's so funny. Like, uh, it's only been a month into the season, and it feels like that was like seven years ago that, that happened. Right, and that was for people who don't remember. That was what he nicknamed the Lance Stevenson, Javale McGee, Michael Beasley, Rajon Rondo squad. <laughs> so the funny thing is, um, Javale McGee doesn't really play much with uh, with Rondo and Stevenson because he's you know with the starters a lot, um, and. Rondo and Stevenson actually had this funky little lineup going with Contavious Caldwell Pope and Josh Hart, who are, you know, nominally four guards together, but they would, would play all four of them together. And in this funky little bench unit that was really doing quite a nice job before Rondo broke his hand. Um, yeah. uh, you know, it was, it was hard to say how well those guys were going to endear themselves to the Laker fan base when they were all signed, but I mean, people love JaVale McGee. When you talk about, like, a little local color, like, 
he's the guy who wears a fanny pack to every game and did his post game interview on Halloween in a Grinch <laughs> costume. And that was amazing. Love he it. That his headband fits perfectly in like this little gap in his haircut. So when his headband moves up, you can see like a little bald spot. Uh, <laughs> just a wonderful little character that we have here. And he's uh, become pretty beloved among the fan base. Just works really hard, blocks a lot of shots, which to be fair, the perimeter defenders funnel a lot of guys to him. Um, even Rondo has been much more well received than I would have expected considering his history with the Boston Celtics. Uh, one of those guys just like, you know, has the intangibles of what it takes to play the point guard position and really settle down a lot of the younger players who are struggling to figure out their role in this new system. And even Lance Stevenson, like he's got this new little celebration where he does a strumming of an air guitar with three fingers when he hits a three, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, they're, they're still going to be characters, but when they're on your team, you kind of love them a little bit more than when they're not. Yeah, and they're not on, like, four-year contracts, so you can, <laughs> you can enjoy them while they're there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I we've pretty much taken up all of your time. I know you need to go because you've got a game to cover. But uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight to catch us up on how things are going down in L.A. Do you want to tell people how they can find your work? Absolutely. So, uh, like you said at the top of the broadcast, I uh, write for the Espination sites for the Lakers and the Clippers. And you can pretty much find all of my work on Twitter at Sabrina JM. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we will uh, hope to talk to you another time and find out how things are going even more later on. Yeah, thanks so much. This is great. Always love talking with basketball. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Always happy to have our next guest join us. Janelle Moore is a writer for B-Ball Index and Golden State of Mind. She covers the Golden State Warriors. This is, I think, your third time on Women's Hoops and Talks. So we got, I think you're our first three-peat. Welcome. Uh, nice to be here. <laughs> Great. Well, so we are checking in with our friends to find out how things are going with their teams. And so you're up next to talk about the Golden State Warriors. Cassie, why don't you take it away? Yeah. So I'm not sure. Uh, so I don't know what you expected from this season from the Golden State Warriors, but I don't think that this is the season so far that I really expected from them. Uh, as someone who watches the team regularly, how do you think this season has gone it's just, it's been odd so far, but at the same time, it is to be expected because it's, it is hard to repeat. It is hard to keep that nucleus together and play at that high level, especially when, you know, other teams are, are catching up and trying to close the gap. So it is what I've expected, but the circus isn't what I expected. That makes sense. Yeah, there has been a lot of talk about a lot of different things and it seems like maybe this is a team that's just kind of figuring a few things out before they really hit the main part of the season yes yes they are um and I think I just want to start without the whole start um without talking about Draymond and KD right now yeah. I just want to talk about where they are as a whole before I get into Draymond and KD <laughs> um the Warriors' biggest weaknesses are the the bench and at the five. And the bench is kind of expected because when we got KD, we, we gutted the whole bench. Mm -hmm. And due to the salary cap issues, you know, we were signing, signing people at the minimum. And the only thing that we have to offer is the chance to get a championship. And That seems like a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah that, I'll take that it. means that things are really bitten us in the butt. You know, we are routinely at, outscored, you know, bench-wise. But we do have some gems. I mean, you know, like um, Quinn Cook, whenever he is locked in and aggressive, and um, Damian Lee, whenever he's aggressive and taking threes. You know, he, he needs a, much to be desired on defense, though, but, you know, he can improve on that. Um, really impressed with Afonso McKinney. I mean, his story is just 
remarkable. And it's just the testament to if you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to get it. And that's what he's done. And he's made the most out of his opportunity up until he got injured. I haven't heard about him. That story hasn't made it up through to anything that I've read. So can you tell us a little bit more about him? Alfonso McKinney? Yeah, I, for some reason I haven't heard. He he was playing in Mexico, of all places, you know, before he spent like $175 to try out for the Bulls' Gene League affiliate. He made that team and also did well with it team. I think he made the Genie Golf Star with the Windy City Bulls. He got on with Toronto last year and they cut him. And luckily the Warriors gave him a call and that is because um, he was related to Steph's old bodyguard. Huh. That's so... And, and he made his way into our organization. You know, he made his way into training camp and um, with the whole issue with Patrick McCall and for the fact that Alfonso was out playing house and um, Damien, he got that spot. And, you know, he has really made the most out of his opportunity. That's really awesome. Good for him. Mm -hmm. I love seeing players work their way up to get to where they are because I think they're more fun players to watch because of it. And the journey just draws you in. Yes. As popular as the NBA is, we do have a lot of casual fans, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. And it just seems like they are more drawn into storylines, and that's a great storyline. I mean, who doesn't love uh, the underdog? Mm -hmm. They love the underdog story, but when that underdog becomes the favorite, that's when the turn comes. Of course, that's what happened with Steph. Yeah. So uh, Afonso was solid for the bench, and um, Damian also, and Gian Giannis has been pretty solid thus far. I mean, he struggled during the preseason and during the early goings of the season, but he he hustles. He's very attentive. He really want to try and make himself better. Do you mean uh, Giannis Jarebko? Is that yes. who you're talking about? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, him. Well, you have a pretty good center who's uh, supposed to be coming back later on in the season, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I cannot wait till DeMarcus come, and, and we need him. Because the centers that we have, I mean, it's, you know, they mean well. I, I'm just saying, they, they mean well. <laughs> Joan, Jones, they seem to put invest more into Jones because of his um, – his building, his athleticism. They're trying to use him like how uh, we use Javel as that vertical spacing. But, you know, he doesn't have the, the awareness like um, like Looney does. And I, I really believe that Looney is the most uh, fundamentally sound one out of the group. Jordan Bell is the most athletic. And I really don't like the how Kerr is using Jordan. It just seems to me, and I may be wrong, it just seems to me that Kerr don't know what he wants from Jordan. He don't know if he wants Jordan to be a Draymond Green type or, or what. And it's just really messing with his confidence and messing with, you know, his time and rotation. Yeah, I can see that happening. Uh, you mentioned, well, we mentioned DeMarcus is going to be coming back at some point. Uh, how do you feel like this team is going to adjust having DeMarcus in the lineup? It'll be, it won't mesh instantly. Yeah, DeMarcus is out here just really observing the system, but it's a, it's a difference between observation and just getting it in there. I already know that DeMarcus will be, I mean, whatever condition DeMarcus returns in would be better than the centers that we had in the past, you know, offensively as far as getting the bucket, you know, like Zaza and, and all them. And he is a solid passer out of the post. But yeah. as far as it fitting, you know, it'll be tough for a few games, but I think DeMarcus is smart enough to um, adjust and adapt. And besides, uh, there's a lot riding on his ad adaptation and adjustment. So, Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see 
it seems like Steve Kerr kind of has his hands full this year. Or is he trying to, is he, is he, you know, just trying to keep everybody engaged like he was saying earlier? Or, you know, it, it feels a little bit more disjointed than, than in the past. I mean, the comment that he made the other day about like being in the real NBA, like, what do you, what do you make of that? Now that really set me off. That, <laughs> and if you have been following me on uh, Twitter, what yeah. I, I have been posting gifts of Millie Vanilli, whatever <laughs> Kurt called. <laughs> I, I have criticized him. I mean, you know, LeVar Ball said that, you know, he was the Millie Vanilla coach, and it just seems to me that his his stubbornness and his uh, failure to just adjust to the personnel he has mm-hmm. is just really making me think that, you know, I mean, he's a little bit overrated as a coach. A little bit. Yeah. Do you think a lot of that coaching changed? Because I know that you had mentioned that he's not as – He's not as good as making good in-game transitions and in-game uh, changes. Do you think yeah. that that changed with uh, Luke Walton leaving? That's a good question. Because Luke, I mean, look at Luke now. Yeah. You know, the system got Luke that job in L.A. Yeah. Curry system, and Curry is a big part of it. Oh, yeah. And it just seems like, again, it just seems like that Kerr fails to adjust to the personnel he has and play to their strengths without Steph being on the floor. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest takeaway. And uh, speaking of Steph, um, he is slated to make his return sometime in this road trip. And the fan in me was hoping that he would make it Thursday. And I tweeted, you know, if it's wrong with you, you know, like, like, a, come on, man. And, and I got, I got criticized uh, for it by, by a former follower, but you know, I don't care about that. I felt what I felt and I said what I said. Everybody else is allowed to ha- um, be a fan for a little bit. Why can't I? So is that because you wanted him to come back sooner or did you want him to wait? Cause I, I'm not familiar with what his timetable was expected to be. See, with the warriors, in every injury, they take conservative precautions and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with that, especially with a piece like Steph. And he is, I say the most valuable player on that team. And, and you, you want to be conservative, but I'm just wondering you know, are you being a little bit too conservative? That that was my whole premise. And plus, he he was in practice for a couple of days. He scrimmaged without any problems. And I'm just thinking, what else does he need to do to prove that he's okay? Knowing the competitor that he is and playing myself, you know, as a player, just looking at that point of view, he want to get out there and play. He want to get out there and, and help. Yeah. And that was my whole uh, issue with it. But, you know, I'm not going to censor myself for anybody. I said what I said and I felt what I felt. Good. And nor, nor should you. <laughs> okay, so I have a dynasty question. Um, yeah. So a lot of people are talking about, you know, Golden State being a dynasty. And to me, a dynasty occurs when you really – like pass on the torch to the next generation. Like when, when you've got, when you've not only developed the players that you have, but you're developing the players who are going to come and replace them. So if you were going to look at the roster right now, like I, I can, some, somebody nationally the other day made a comment about how like clay and Draymond are going to just be like the Manu Ginobili and, um, and, uh, you know, Tony Parker, they're going to just be there forever. Well, I guess Tony Parker left, but you know, they're going to be with the team for like a super long time. I don't think Tony wanted to leave San Antonio. No. Yeah. But you know, but both of them were like, they were the heart and soul of that place for so long And you know, Tim Duncan or whatever, but yeah. they always had more players uh, coming up and developing along behind them. So do you, do you think that because they gutted the roster so dramatically, like you were saying earlier, um, that they don't really have that in place? Or do you see some potential players that you think that they're going to be 
uh, looking towards developing in the future to eventually, you know, be the next heart and soul of that team? As it looks now, I don't see it. I don't see that that piece, you know, to to success, you know, the Draymonds and the, the Clays, because the roster has been so compromised to uh, welcome Kevin. And it's not a guarantee that he would stay. But even if Kevin stays, Myers still have to figure out a way to get solid players that fit into the Warriors culture and fit into what they are known for to help keep this thing going. And it's going to be tough when you don't have, have the money. And they're not going to have any draft picks. <laughs> no. Or, you know, no. they, don't, they certainly don't have a high draft pick. They haven't really had a draft pick since, if I'm not mistaken, they haven't had a draft pick since Jones and Looney. They bought McCall, McCall's rights, you know, mm-hmm. gave Milwaukee some cash, gave Chicago some cash for Jordan Bell. So yeah. for two years straight, they had to buy themselves into the draft. So it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy at all. Even if KD leaves, they have to to replace him some kind of way. And, you know, they still have that salary cap hit even if he leaves. So it's, it's going to be tough. And that's what, I think that's what the demise of the Bulls were, was, other than ego, but just the cap. They traded Pippen away to Portland. After they won, I think they traded Pippen and Kerr to Portland after they won in 98. I might have to look that up. That sounds right. Are you ready to address the Draymond and Kevin Durant situation? Or is there anything else you want to say about the team? Yes, I want to address the Dre and KD thing. I really believe that the Dre and KD thing was blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. Like MC Hammer said... Um, during the interview with NBC Sports Bay Area, you know, brothers are going to spat. They're going to fight. But when it comes to the outside, you're not going to talk about your sibling or, you, you know, your brother. And that's what I thought it was. And it, what was supposed to be a spat about philosophy in the game was just escalated. And it was, and I believe it was just something that Draymond was harboring as it pertains to KD's free agency situation. I mean, he hasn't he hasn't really made a spectacle out of it, but the media has been making a spectacle out of it because, you know, they want him off of Golden State. Mm-hmm. And they tr- they trying to they trying to damn this to get him off of Golden State. You know, and I feel like 90% of the NBA media is either in uh, in Oakland or in Los yep. Angeles right now. And so they're looking for anything that they can blow up. And they're all trying to compete with each other to get it first. <laughs> but see, the thing about Draymond Green is that he, you know, not only that he is a, a hard worker and, and, and is a dog as far as a player goes, you know, who was willing to do that dirty work and knowing his lane and cultivating his lane. He is just a straight up dude and loyal. And, you know, he just want to know, you know, I guess he was feeling that, you know, what, what are you doing, Katie? You know, are, are you really with us? And it kind of, it, unfortunately it has overflowed into what it's been. But what's the deal with the team suspending him for the game? What do you think of that? I didn't agree with that. I didn't agree with that because there is a still a possibility of KD leaving and knowing that that hurt Draymond and that would probably have me thinking about my future with the team and he would probably leave, you know, and then what? So that, that was kind of touchy. Yeah. I thought that was, I thought that was strange. I thought that was odd. And the amount of money yeah. that, um, that he was fine, a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. You you only get fined twenty five thousand for criticizing the ref. Yeah, I think this figure was like that's how much he lost for because he he got suspended without pay. So that's how much he made would have made for the game. But like, I was like, I surprised they made that public. I guess. Yeah, because it just seems like 
the Warriors are still recruiting KD. Even KD said, no, nah, I don't need all of that. I know what you guys mm-hmm. are about. But the Warriors still feel like they want to solidify their chances in July. And you yeah. can't really blame them for that. I mean, the whole tour of the new arena with KD, that... I think that spoke to that too, the video that came out of them touring him around the new arena for next year. Yes, and he was there for the, I, I guess, the, the, you know, breaking of the ground, you know. Mm-hmm. Wearing his little hard hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if they had to get a custom made hard hat because they're just so much bigger people. No, no, no. <laughs> no. No, I, I don't think so. Regular hard hats for all. Great. <laughs> or, and maybe an extra large KD, vest, though. I mean, take away the height, KD. I mean, KD yeah, is like a regular guy. I mean, his head isn't as big as other people's head. I mean, you know, <laughs> that that would fit him just fine. They'd have to get Shaq a different one, but Katie's fine. Right. I, I don't. I don't really think that you know he needed a bigger helmet. He, <laughs> he may have needed like some pants or something like that. But it's him being so tall, I don't think there's you know any construction pants or whatever that that would fit him so well what do you think do you think he's gonna stay or go i think he'll as crazy as this may sound i think he'll stay Hmm. and i say that because for one kd wants his money the warriors are the ones that could give him the max they got his bird right rights and all that and for two i don't think whatever he has with draymond will get in the way with said money. And for three, KD had some interesting um, new ink during the off season. He has a Just Us tattoo on his left thigh. That's what the Warriors say in the huddle. Oh. (gasps) Yeah, how are you going to explain that to your new team? (laughs) Coming in with your Warriors tattoo. And I really believe that he loves it in the area. I mean, in spite of Draymond. Yeah. What about the lure of, you know, having his own team? Well, he got a he got a taste of that when Steph was out. How he had to carry the load. How frustrated he was in the early goings of, you know, you know, since the Clippers games and the early goings of the um slump. I don't think he would want to go back to that again. Hmm. I don't care what the national media says. They just want him off the t- off the Warriors. So their teams can have a shot. And so they can be fans. Mm -hmm. See, they get to be fans, but I can't be a fan because I'm a (laughs) (laughs) know-it-all. You're a realist. I mean... Uh, that's one of the things I you know love about following you and reading your stuff is that you know you don't get caught up in the you know the mystique of you know of the team like when we talked to you earlier this year and we were like you know what's on your mind and you were like I want to know if Patrick McCaw is going to sign and I was like what like that's <laughs> that was not what the main narrative was and then sure enough a couple weeks later people start talking about like huh. So he still hasn't signed. Um, But, you know, you look at them, I think, with a realistic eye, while the rest of us are kind of just still a little bit uh, in awe of their of their skill and their abilities. Maybe that's what I'm in awe of of the team. What I'm really in awe of with this team is just the fact that they are regular guys at the end of the day. Yeah, they do some extraordinary stuff out there night after night, Um, but they are really, you know, ordinary guys, just really real down-to-earth guys, even even Coach Kerr. And what makes Coach Kerr so good, even though I get on his helmet about his um, strategy sometimes, but he is a great manager of egos and a manager of people and and their thoughts and and everything. And that's what makes him a a great coach. Okay, so... We should probably wrap up our time, but I, I got a, uh, one more question for you, and, and then you can follow up if you have any more questions, Cassidy. Okay. The next time the Blazers play the Golden State Warriors, what do they need to do to stop them? Stop the, the Warriors? Yeah. How are the Blazers <laughs> going to match up best against the Warriors? Keep going to the paint because they the Warriors get beat soundly in the paint. Against Milwaukee, 
the Warriors surrendered 84 points in the paint. Oh my God. Well, oh my how many of those were Giannis dunks? Like 40 points worth? Yeah. <laughs> no. No. They surrendered four, 84 points in the paint to Milwaukee. And wow. nearly, I, I believe, 58 or 60, I think it was 62 points to the Nets. See, that goes to show you that the center position is the weakest. Mm-hmm. Boogie and Draymond has been getting on um, Damian Jones to be aggressive. And I don't think he's that guy. I mean, he's been in Sa- in Santa Cruz as longer than he's been in Oakland. So that must tell you something. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know why Kerr and I know why Ron Adams is trying to, you know, invest in him. But, you know, I, I don't know about this one. <laughs> I, I really don't. If he can string together performances such as last night, then he'll be fine. But I just don't see it. And whatever uh, version of DeMarcus Cousins we got is our best best at center. Oh, man, that's going to be scary. I know. I'm terrified. And the best at center. And also, we don't want to use Draymond at the five as much as we have in the past. Not unless we downright have to. Mm-hmm. Is that because you think he's losing a step or just because that's just you don't think that's overall the best plan? That's overall the best plan. He's not losing a step. He's just have been unfortunate with injuries. Mm-hmm. And that is due to the way he plays. He plays hard. Mm-hmm. He's the one that's hustling. He's the one that's getting the, the loose balls. He's the one that's um, battling in the paint with um, behemoths. <laughs> not Steph and them. Not even KD. It's Draymond. So, and he's only like, what, six seven? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's not a good idea from a strategic standpoint. You know, and that's why they, the Warriors are trying so hard to develop their centers. So we got to score in the paint next game. <laughs> um, well, rumor has it you are not just a Steph Curry fan, but you also appreciate Seth Curry. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. You got any fun Seth Curry fact for us to leave us on a happy blazer note? <laughs> I would be repeating myself. I mean, I I told, I said in the last podcast that, you know, he mm-hmm. liked to hunt and, and fish and everything. Nice. And, and he has a, a little girl named Carter. He seems like a, a, a pretty under the radar guy. And like, you know, it was fun when uh, Steph was, when, when they played against each other, they just seemed so like genuinely happy to see each other. They seem, you know, close. They, they are, they, they really are. And, I kind of wish that um, Myers would have reached out to Seth, you know, when he before he signed with you guys, because I like to see where he's at, you know. Now he was in the Warrior system. He was playing for Santa Cruz for a while. No, before he went to Dallas. Way before he went to Dallas. Uh See, he started out in Santa Cruz, and then Cleveland got him. Memphis got him. Phoenix got him for a bunch of. 10-day contracts, and he never really called on until Sacramento gave him a chance. And I really don't believe Sacramento gave him a fair chance because George Carl had an issue of playing a Duke guy, and that was right. (laughs) Yeah, I I agree with that point. (laughs) And injuries really messed him up in Dallas. I thought he would have, you know, called on, but injuries really messed him up. And I, I just... I just like to see him healthy and just see him thrive because he really is a, a good player. He's, you know, and he works, he has worked hard to get back on the court. Mm-hmm. So I love to see him succeed. Yeah. So, so would we, we would love it too. <laughs> He's getting more time. He, he, he played quite a few minutes the other night against the Clippers when Nurkic went out and they had to like do some quick li- lineup adjustments and they played a three guard lineup with Dame and Seth and CJ for quite a while. And that was, that was pretty interesting. Is it um, fair to say that um, his minutes are sporadic? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought, you know, I think if he had some, if he was a regular in the rotation and he knew where his minutes was coming from, I think his production would increase. Yeah. I think we may see that later down in the season. I know 
last season we definitely saw Stotts try a bunch of different lineups early on. So I'm hoping we get more settled into a pattern later in the season. <laughs> hey, Jennifer, they trying. They trying. <laughs> We're trying, they Jennifer. <laughs> Well, Janelle, thank you so much for joining us tonight and getting us caught up on how things are going down there. Will you uh, go ahead and tell people how they can find your work? Okay. If they're not following me, uh, my handle on Twitter is Janelle12. That is J-A-N-N-E-L-L-E-12. And they can see me uh, tweeting my work from B-Ball Index and Golden State of Mind. Awesome. And you have like a, a weekly one um, in B-Ball Index. Is that correct? Yeah. And that's called Town Business. I named that column Town Business because this is the Warriors last year in Oakland. And Oakland is called the town. And, you know, I want to, to honor that. No, I'm not from the Bay. I'm from North Carolina. But I am well versed in, you know, traveling and well-versed in culture and that's their culture. And, and I, I want to honor that. Oh, that's nice. Awesome. Well, thank you again for uh, joining us. And I'm sure we will be talking to you later in the season too. Well, that is going to do it for this episode of women's hoops and talks. I gotta say, we're going to need a little time to digest everything that we just learned. We only talked about three different teams, the Lakers, the Clippers, and Golden State, but there was a lot of information there. Anything stand out to you, Cassidy? Uh, I definitely feel like I need to go watch all three teams play a lot of games now because I feel like I learned so much and now I want to watch for certain players, especially um, uh, it was it Harrell from uh, Golden State? Uh, you mean uh, Montrez Harrell from Clippers? Yes. Yes. That's definitely want to look into that and then I also think that I'm going to be watching Golden State pretty carefully once DeMarcus gets in there because I want to see how that uh having a different five in there affects the game I know it was like when she kind of painted the picture of how they are so weak in that area right now and then it just became like crystal clear in my mind what it was going to look like when they did have somebody in that center position i was like oh no it looks scary (laughs) it looks like it really (laughs) does it really does but you know Um, she's also like i was saying when we were talking to her like realistic like they mm -hmm. are they are fallible and like i don't know how you know discussing you know with the contract situation like how they're gonna how they're going to maintain this to be a dynasty if they're out of money. Yeah. And I liked the comparison to the Bulls. Uh, I think that will be interesting to see what what happens there. Does it turn out like that? Do they figure it out? I really don't know. Yeah. Well, I think we have um, a lot to think about. The Blazers are entering a really tough part of their schedule. And uh, we talked a little bit about rotations. And um, on the last weekly podcast, we talked about how this is kind of going to be the time of year because of the difficulty of the schedule where Stotts is likely going to be choosing the guys who are going to be his main go-to guys. So once we know who those those folks are, uh, we can think a little bit more about how they're going to match up against some of these other teams. But like right now, it's like, I don't even know who's going to be in. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who's playing. I mean, is I know Evan is going to be in there, there, but like, is it going to be Stauskas? Is it going to be Curry? Um, you yeah. know, who's, who's going to be the ninth man, right? And maybe we'll just have a surprise person, you know, they just, they haven't played and then all of a sudden it's a surprise. Yeah. Sometimes they just insert someone uh, into the lineups. Well, so Cassidy, how is things? How are things going on Twitter? I know that you rejoined Twitter after not having been on it for a super long time. Everything going okay there? There, uh, I'm there. Uh, not saying much yet, but I'll get there. <laughs> Have uh, you found any good follows? Uh, following a lot of the classics right now, but I think I'm gonna dive deeper into that realm this week. So wish me luck. Every time <laughs> this last, uh, these losses that the Blazers suffer always give me a really good opportunity to um, mute the mute people. <laughs> cause I'm like, Oh yeah, you don't like all these things that I really like. And cause like, you know, if the Blazers, if the Blazers are 
making a bunch of uh, boneheaded mistakes and people feel the need to bring it up over and over and over again until it's just like a tired old story. I'm like, you know what? I don't need to hear that all the time. So no. So even though, uh, you know, trying to find some kind of silver linings in three losses in a row and that Zach Collins block, that is the silver lining. (laughs) That was amazing. (laughs) That, you know, uh, it's really interesting to see him struggle because he's kind of been handled pretty much with kid gloves this whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, give him a little bit of line, see what happens, you know, reel it back in if he has trouble. And just these last few games when he's gotten in foul trouble, Stotts just lets him stay out there until he flames out. And it's like, ooh, okay. Well, I guess I'm going to have to foul less to stay in more minutes. You'll yeah. learn. Yeah, I I do think that kind of like Nurkic and maybe all basketball players are like this. I do feel like sometimes when uh, things are not going well, I like the energy that he gets fired up with. Um, Yeah. I like the look that he gets in his eye. Oh, I love angry players. They're my favorite (laughs) when they're angry. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, they they often they play really 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 well. Well, so anyway, speaking of Twitter, why don't you tell people how they can find you and follow you? Uh, you, you can find me at Cassidy Gemmet, G E M M E T. I'm there. And uh, you can find me at TCB Biggs on Twitter. And if you want to follow the podcast, you can go to whatever your favorite podcast catcher is and look for the Blazers Edge podcast because we are part of the Blazers Edge podcast feed. And the Hoops and Talks edition comes out every other Thursday. Women's Hoops and Talks is also on Twitter. We are at Hoops and Talks on Twitter. And we have a monthly meetup, and our next monthly meetup is coming up in December. That's going to be December 19th. We meet meet at the McMinimans on Broadway in Portland, Oregon. So if you are in town, you should come and join us. We have a really good time. We're very loud, and we often scare the other patrons of the restaurant because they want to know what all the shrieking is. Because we do get very into the games, but we also have a super good time. Um, So I guess that'll do it for us for this week. For Cassidy, this is Tara. Thank you so much for listening. 